Hi there, my name is Camille DeAngelis and I am the author of The Boy From Tomorrow, a children's novel. This is my favorite out of all the novels I've written. However, I think it's really important that we authors admit when we make mistakes. And I made several in the course of writing and publishing this book. I talked about my mistakes in a Twitter thread I titled Confessions of a Clueless White Lady Novelist. I want to take a moment to define white privilege for any of my younger readers who may be learning about it for the first time. When we use the phrase white privilege, we're referring to the inherent advantages possessed by a white person on the basis of their race in a society characterized by racial inequality and injustice. I use the word clueless to describe myself because white people start out largely unaware of the profoundly unfair advantages we have in this society. We tend to notice and react to only the most blatant expressions of racism and systematized oppression. That is, until we begin to educate ourselves to see the subtle but systematic oppression we've been culturally trained not to see and figure out how to become better neighbors, friends, and allies. Let me give you a concrete example of how I have benefited from white privilege. When I was 19, I had the opportunity to write for a guidebook. That was my full-time job for the summer. I traveled and researched for five weeks, and then I had about two and a half months to compose a book-length manuscript. Like many college students do, I pulled a few all-nighters in order to finish the project more or less on time, and on one of these very late nights, I decided to go for a quick jog through my mom's suburban neighborhood to wake myself up so I could get a couple more hours of writing in before I crashed. This was about three o'clock in the morning. As I was jogging on the side of the road, a police car pulled up to me and the officer inside asked if everything was all right. I said yes, and he drove on. Now, if I had been a young black man out for a run in a predominantly white neighborhood at three o'clock in the morning, I can guarantee you that that officer would have assumed that I was up to no good, and he would have treated me accordingly. Best case scenario, he would have questioned me with a suspicious attitude, and I would have felt very uncomfortable and afraid, even though I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. But because I was a white girl, the officer assumed that if something was wrong, I would have been the one running away from the trouble rather than the one causing it. That's just one small example of white privilege. Okay, back to The Boy From Tomorrow. The book is set in both 2016 and 1916. Alec and Josie are living in the same house a century apart, and they form a friendship through a hand-painted spirit board that belongs to Josie's mother in 1916. Lavinia is a suffragist and makes rousing speeches for women's rights, and it takes Josie some time to realize that what her mother argues for in public doesn't match how she actually lives her life. In the course of this Twitter thread, I directed my readers to the classroom guide available on my website, and I discussed how many, if not most, white women suffragists were horribly racist. They wanted the vote for themselves, not for all women. One of my readers replied that while it was nice to have that historical context in the classroom guide, most of my readers probably weren't going to seek it out. Glitter Femme pointed out that while technically every woman in America could vote after the passage of the 19th Amendment in August 1920, this definitely was not true in reality. Many women of color continued to be denied suffrage until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and even nowadays people of color can show up to vote only to find their names mysteriously erased from the poll lists. This is white supremacist ideology at work. Here's the passage in question. I have submitted the edit to my publisher, so that should be updated in the ebook version soon and in all subsequent printings of the paperback edition. To give you insight into what the women's suffrage movement was really like for women of color, I'm going to read you an excerpt from Angela Davis's brilliant and necessary book, Women, Race, and Class, first published in 1981. This chapter opens with a recollection from Ida B. Wells, a journalist and activist whose work was intersectional at a time long before most people could grasp the concept of interrelated oppressions. Wells writes, One morning, Susan B. Anthony had engagements in the city which would prevent her from using the stenographer whom she had engaged. She remarked at the breakfast table that I could use the stenographer to help me with my correspondence since she had to be away all the morning and that she would tell her when she went upstairs to come in and let me dictate some letters to her. When I went upstairs to my room, I waited for her to come in. 
When she did not do so, I concluded that she didn't find it convenient and went on writing my letters in longhand. When Miss Anthony returned, she came to my room and found me busily engaged. You didn't care to use my secretary, I suppose. I told her to come to your room when you came upstairs. Didn't she come? I said no. She said no more, but turned and went into her office. Within ten minutes, she was back again in my room. The door being open, she walked in and said, Well, she's gone. And I said, Who? She said, The stenographer. I said, Gone where? Why, she said. I went into the office and said to her, You didn't tell Miss Wells what I said about writing some letters for her? The girl said, No, I didn't. Well, why not? Then the girl said, It is all right for you, Miss Anthony, to treat Negroes as equals, but I refuse to take dictation from a colored woman. Indeed, said Miss Anthony. Then, she said, you needn't take any more dictation from me. Miss Wells is my guest, and any insult to her is an insult to me. So if that is the way you feel about it, you needn't stay any longer. This interchange between Susan B. Anthony and Ida B. Wells, who later founded the first black women's suffrage club, occurred during those precious days in which I, Wells, sat at the feet of this pioneer and vet veteran in the work of women's suffrage. Wells' admiration for Anthony's individual stance against racism was undeniable, and her respect for the suffragists' contributions to the women's rights campaign was profound. But she unhesitatingly criticized her white sister for failing to make her personal fight against racism a public issue of the suffrage movement. Susan B. Anthony was never lacking in praises for Frederick Douglass, consistently reminding people that he was the first man to publicly advocate for the enfranchisement of women. She considered him a lifetime honorary member of her suffrage organization. Yet, as Anthony explained to Wells, she pushed Douglas aside for the sake of recruiting white Southern women into the movement for women's suffrage. In our conventions, he was the honored guest who sat on our platform and spoke at our gatherings. But when the Suffrage Association went to Atlanta, Georgia, knowing the feeling of the South with regard to Negro participation on equality with whites, I myself asked Mr. Douglas not to come. I did not want to subject him to humiliation, and I did not want anything to get in the way of bringing the Southern white women into our suffrage association. In this particular conversation with Ida B. Wells, Anthony went on to explain that she had also refused to support the efforts of several black women who wanted to form a branch of the suffrage association. She did not want to awaken the anti-black hostility of her white Southern members who might withdraw from the organization if black women were admitted. And you think I was wrong in so doing, she asked. I answered uncompromisingly yes, for I felt that although she may have made gains for suffrage, she had also confirmed white women in their attitude of segregation. This conversation between Ida B. Wells and Susan B. Anthony took place in 1894. Anthony's self-avowed capitulation to racism on the ground of expediency characterized her public stance on this issue until she resigned in 1900 from the presidency of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. When Wells admonished Anthony for legitimizing the Southern white women's commitment to segregation, the underlying question was far more consequential than Anthony's individual attitude. Racism was objectively on the rise during this period, and the rights and lives of black people were at stake. By 1894, the disenfranchisement of black people in the South, the legal system of segregation, and the reign of lynch law were already well established. More than at any other time since the Civil War, this was an era demanding consistent and principled protests against racism. The incre increasingly influential expediency argument proposed by Anthony and her colleagues was a feeble justification for the suffrag suffragists' indifference to the pressing requirements of the times. Okay, I'm going to move on. Just skip a paragraph here. Ida B. Wells's uncompromising criticism of Susan B. Anthony's public indifference toward racism was certainly justified by the prevailing social conditions, but something far deeper than historical evidence was involved. Just two years before the two women's debate on suffrage and racism, Wells had suffered a traumatic first-hand encounter with racist mob violence. The three victims of Memphis's first lynching since the riots of 1866 were personal friends of hers. The horrible incident itself inspired Wells to investigate and expose the accelerating pattern of mob murders throughout the southern states. Traveling in England in 1893, seeking support for her crusade against lynching, she vigorously decried the silence with which hundreds and thousands of mob murders had been received. In the past 10 years, over a thousand black men and women and children have met this violent death at the hands of a white mob, and the rest of America has remained silent. 
The pulpit and press of our country remain silent on these continued outrages, and the voice of my race, thus tortured and outraged, is stifled or ignored wherever it is lifted in America in a demand for justice. Given the uncamouflaged violence visited upon black people during the 1890s, how could white suffragists argue in good faith that for the sake of expediency they should stoop to conquer on this color question? The ostensibly neutral stance assumed by the leadership of the NAWSA with respect to the color question actually encouraged the proliferation of undisguised racist ideas within the ranks of the suffrage campaign. And Susan B. Anthony was the best of them. There's a lot more in here. I actually think that this book should be required reading for every American. I should have read it in high school. I wish it had been required that I read this in high school, but I guess better late than never, right? Thank you so much to Glitter Femme for taking the time to challenge me to do better. Thank you so much to you for watching this video. If you have any reactions to what you have learned today, I would love to hear it in the comments or feel free to ping me on social media. Also be sure to check out some links that I've included in the video notes below um, with more information about the racist history of the women's suffrage movement. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day.